All right, everybody, thanks for joining us here today. My name is Eric Wilkinson. This is being recorded. Uh, this is implementation of options to build a portfolio. Well, with a protective put, I don't know if it's necessarily building a portfolio, but it absolutely is something that we should be considering putting into our portfolio in and around underlines we already currently own. Uh, and or if you're thinking about buying something, um, maybe it's taken a dip and uh, you're thinking, I want to add some uh, stocks to my portfolio. Well, you can do this with a, not only a protected put, but a married put. And we'll go into all of those uh, details as to how that all works out. But uh, let me get a couple of things out of the way real quick. My name's Eric Wilkinson. Yes, you may very well recognize me from mainstream media as the Wolfman, where I've talked about everything from economic to geopolitical and market analysis. I actually do that in these daily market in daily market commentaries as well. And then I layer on top of that these option strategies that I'm teaching you in these webinars and how to implement those into our portfolio there as well. So I'm not cherry picking anything. We go through uh, every trade that I do basically. I'm not trying to solicitate you guys to buy it or giving you guys recommenda recommendations, but I want to give you real life what I'm going through on a day-to-day -day basis and how uh, we manage that risk, how we're managing losers. You know, we all have losers. And what I do is go through uh, on a day-to-day -day basis how we continuously stay mechanical so that we can sleep at night. Uh, so basically, uh, I've traded from college actually with a psychology degree, switched that over to finance uh, because I really enjoyed trading. And then after graduating with a finance degree, moved straight to Chicago and started working on the floor of the board of trade. So in that entire time, I've traded everything from stocks, financial futures, commodity futures, currencies, and options on all these products and just about all market conditions. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Wolfman's blog or a parent company at Pro Trader Strap for market wisdom or snark coming out of me. And uh, follow us on our Facebook page at ProTraderStrategies.com. We're throwing out a lot of content there. Sometimes we'll throw out one or two of these webinars uh, and or the daily market commentary. So please go through and check that out. Some of you guys that are familiar with my webinars, this is the disclaimer page. It's gotten a little bit thicker because we wanna make sure you guys understand we are an educational company. Everything we are doing is for educational purposes. Uh, anything that you guys end up doing, you realize that it is on your own accord, all right? So uh, we are trying to teach you guys how to swim. I am not a part of the guys that do the herd mentality where we are trying to get you guys to limbing off a cliff with me. All right, I want you guys to learn these option strategies, take your own assumptions, and then be able to implement these strategies in and around your own portfolio in your own way, according to your own risk parameters. That's why I can't give you guys advice, you guys. I, I don't know what your risk parameters are. I don't even know what's in your portfolio. So how could I possibly say something is good for you and or your portfolio? All right, this, this is going to be on the protective puts. and Let's go over the profit and loss on protective puts. It's your max profit is unlimited. And that is on the put itself. It means that, you know, it goes down to zero. Well, that's really, if it goes down to zero, that is your max profit uh, from where you your strike is to zero. So uh, it's the purchase price of that strike. So your strike price plus the premium uh, less the current price. So that is where your profit potential is. But the one thing to know with those puts, if you just bought the puts outright, you know, it would be the price of the puts uh, down to zero for the most part and minus that premium we paid. Your max loss on this uh, is limited to the premium you paid. One thing we need to know with this max loss kind of thing, one, I didn't mention a while back when I did these protective puts. You got to know that when you're buying a put, that does increase uh, what you synthetically paid for that underlying. So keep that in mind. You don't want to uh, get too aggressive with buying these puts. You want to do it when you have an assumption that, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little bit worried, maybe at uh, all time highs or uh, they come up with some forward guidance that doesn't look too rosy. Um, but your max loss on this is the purchase price of that underlying plus the premium it paid for that strike 
and then minus that strike price. We're gonna go over all of this. It seems a little confusing there, but if you bought the stock at 100, let's say we bought the uh, 75 strike, right? And then the premium we paid for that. So that all comes into account. So our max loss is going to be limited to basically where that strike price is, that 75 strike, we're not gonna lose any more than that. But keep in mind that premium that put is going to continuously increase. And I can't give you an exact example of that because that premium is going to adjust due to volatility and things of that nature. But think of it this way, the reason why I like this uh, protective put versus a stop, right? If I add the stop on at the 75, area say i was long the underlying at 100 and put a stop in there at 75 well for one we never know exactly where we're getting out on that site stop if it was a flash crash or something crazy happened you know that stop goes to the market and if you had a stop limit order it would uh maybe never get hit at least with the put you have peace of mind knowing exactly where your out is all right so if I add on the 75 put, I could know that I would limit my loss at that 75 strike. The kicker to it though is that put that I had on is gonna increase in value. So it's actually gonna help me if this market starts coming off, whereas that, uh, that stop would never help you. So this might clear up some of it uh, a little bit here. As you can see here, the stock, uh, declines below where your strike price is, right? So this is where our strike price is. And then this is also where that premium, that gap is where that premium is, where we had to pay, you know, 50 cents or something for it. So really our break even is going to be that strike price uh, minus that premium that we ended up paying. So it's a little bit lower. And remember what I talked about with the, uh, what we were talking about with the, underlying is it's going to kind of increase what we paid uh what we paid for that underlying which causes our uh payoff to be a little bit lower right our payoff on the upside is a little bit lower because we synthetically end up paying more for this underlying by buying uh this protective put but keep in mind when the market goes down we are limiting ourselves to that strike price but this premium on that strike is going to consistently increase as the market goes down, all right? So it's going to help us, but we'll know exactly where we can limit uh, or stop our loss in a sense. All right, so protective puts in lieu of stop orders. I've kind of mentioned this a little bit already, and why is it better than uh, the stops? Well, there's a lot of reasons, actually, for one, uh, you know exactly where, you, you know, when you have a stop, say for instance, if we're looking at a stop order and the market free falls down, right? Well, if I had my stop right there and the market really took a tank, I could get executed on my stop way down here. So maybe I had my 75 strike on, or my 75 stop on, well, this could get executed at 70. Now that's an extreme example, a $5 move in a matter of seconds. But, you know, we've seen markets do crazier things and especially in thin markets that it could very well happen. You know, maybe a better example would be $74 or something like that. But the, you get the idea. Now think about it. If the market did do one of those flash crashes and slam down like this, well, what happens if it rebounds back up like almost immediately? You know, you got stopped out at 75 executed at 70 and then the market immediately rebounds now we've seen that happen back in the day during the flash crash where people were getting stopped out at horrible levels and in a matter of seconds the market swung back up well think about that if this was a 75 put we would have had the patience to be able to sit with that and watch it right because we know we have peace of mind that we are ultimately out at 75. And you can even trade around it. Like you started seeing the bounce, you could cover those puts um, uh, for a profit and watch that rebound happen. So keep that in mind, the puts, uh, we never know exactly where our stop is going to be executed. And the other thing is, is if we had a stop limit, right? If I had a stop limit on, 
and the market did that. Say I had my stop at 75 and the market kind of trickles down and just continuously goes down. Well, my stop limit is there. It never gets executed. I never get filled on that. The market continues to drizzle down, right? Um, so with this, we would have the peace of mind that if we had puts on, we could still uh, stay in our longs for our stock, never have to sell out of it, maybe trade around that and get a profit off of it. Um, and if it continuously did this, then we know that we are out at 75, all right? We can put our stock to somebody, all right? Um, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, even if we didn't want to get out of this stock and this underlying starts going down, our 75 puts are going to increase in value, right? So those values are gonna continuously go up. It's not going to be dollar for dollar for what the underlying is going down. I do have a couple of ways to, I like to trade protective puts rather than just put one on for, you know, uh, keep in mind, you know, one put is equal to a hundred of X, Y, Z, all right? So um, when we're doing that, I like to jack up the puts a couple of times um, in order to uh, take advantage of some trading. You know, I'm a trader at heart. So to me, uh, I like to add a couple, if I'm thinking this market's gonna correct a little bit, I like to add a couple of puts um, and be able to take advantage of a market move that starts moving down. And I'll talk about strike location, all of that stuff, just like I do uh, with my other webinars as well and some of the rules that we're gonna be having to look at here, all right? Um, so we can trade out of some of these. If we you know, have 100 of X, Y, Z, uh, usually I like to do three or four puts. Oops, not 34 puts, but three or four puts. Let's say, or four puts, right? To equal, or equal to my 100 lot, all right? So remember, because we're buying this option, we have the right, but not the obligation to uh to execute these puts or put our stock to somebody else all right uh so we have that peace of mind it's not like you know if you're short puts or something like that you get put that stock right because when you're short you have the obligation to uh honor the contract all right and uh you like i said we can trade around these puts you know you're not going to get dollar for dollar on the downside um, you know, if you didn't want to take capital gains or something like that, this is a great way to uh, take advantage of not having to get out of that stock like a stop would cause you to get out immediately. You're going to have possibly capital gains and stuff like that. All right. And I mentioned this. It's going to let you sleep at night. It's going to allow you to be much more patient going forward. In lieu of a protective puts, what are your thoughts of selling deep in the money call. Um, well, if you sell the deep in the money call or uh, deep in the money call, um, it, you know, you would be selling a deep in the money call. You're probably going to have your stock called away from you possibly. But, um, you know, it, this, it, it won't protect you the same way uh, as a protective put would. If you're talking about like a deep, out of the money call or an out of the money call. Um, you know, I've talked about selling calls around, you know, as a dollar cost averaging. So yes, Chen, that is something that would uh, work out quite nicely. Is everybody else, uh, can you guys get me up in the questions box? It seems like uh, George lost some sound. Um, you don't have to worry about the theta decay. Well, correct. So Chen, what I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that here in a minute about theta decay and how to limit some of that. Um, and I have some rules that go in and around buying options. You know, I'm if you've watched very many of my webinars or especially those daily market commentaries, then um, then you will definitely know that I'm not a huge fan of buying uh, options. I'd much rather sell some options take advantage of theta decay, but there's a lot of situations where, you know, we don't want to be selling calls and puts because the environment's not right for us. Uh, George, are you hearing me okay now? Is anybody else hearing me all right? It looks like 
my mind is working correctly. Yes. All right. Alexander hears me. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Good. Um, so it, you guys, if you lose sound, one of the thing uh, I always say is uh, you got to log out and go back in because it's, I can tell on mine that I'm seeing the volume move um, and on my microphone. So it, it looks good on my end. So I can't always tell if there's sound being lost and that's usually a go-to webinar type thing. All right. So, right. Let's just review real quick. You never have to worry about the stop getting executed, especially at bad levels. A stop limit order will not, might not ever get filled. Uh, you're going to, your puts are going to gain in value as the market moves against your underlying. Um, whereas the stop is just going to execute you out. You know, something like today we had that bit of a down move, right? There's probably a lot of people that got stopped out that were using stop orders. Well, if you had puts on, it allowed you to be patient through that move. And uh, the way I set up these protective puts, like I said, I add a couple extra ones to uh, what I own in the underlying uh, to trade around that if I have it, um, have it start going against me, uh, that it, it allows you to profit on a downward move as well, All right? You never have to get out taking capital gains because you can trade around it. And obviously it allow you to sleep at night a little bit better. You're not like checking to see where it is and if your stop's going to get hit. And, you know, in this day and age, you guys, uh, with algos and stuff like that, we see some volatile moves and those algos are absolutely stop hunting. So, um, you know, this allows you to avoid that as well. All right. So protective puts implemented. To protect your capital gains and the underlying you already own the stock is really what protective puts are but a merry put is implemented when you buy that stock so you go out and buy xyz let's say it's had a correction uh, a downward move or something bearish uh has happened and you think okay this is a good level i want to get in and buy this because i think it's at a good level but you're worried it might break down further and uh you don't you don't really want to deal with that angst that uh, it's going to continue to have bad news like we saw recently with Boeing. You know, I mean, we thought the bad news was out and then all of a sudden more bad news comes out about Boeing. They keep moving the timeline back or something. Maybe you had bought it a little early uh, and wanted to implement some puts in there just to limit some of your risk and allow you to sleep at night, maybe through some of that move. OK. So married puts are when you actually uh, get into this stock. All right. So if we are going to do protective puts and we want, we're worried about this binary event coming up, I would say you would want to do this well in advance of that earnings. Say, for instance, Apple. All right. Apple's a good example right now because, you know, I have there's some bearish news with the coronavirus. Right. So with Apple. Um, you know, they've warned about the iPhone 12 uh, production uh, being a problem. They are going to know until April where well, they've got their earnings coming up uh, in and around that time. It might even get pushed back to May. Uh, so all of those things could start to worry you. And right now would be a good time because they just had their earnings. Implied volatility is pretty low. We're right in between that binary event. So do this well in advance of that binary event. So, you know, I would say like 20 days or something like that would be where I would start thinking. You don't want to do this, uh, put the day before that earnings event. Okay. Don't wait that long. Don't sit on it. I uh, think you're going to get better strike locations and things of that nature, because those, those are going to be filled with volatility and premium is going to be at about its highest you're going to see for the next several months probably and once that binary event comes out the premiums are just going to get sucked away and you literally could be directionally right and not make money at that point in time so you want to do this when there's some pretty low implied volatility all right um and obviously you want to uh protect those unrealized gains unrealized gains mean the stock has gone up well you see your p l you know it's basically a p l thing well you see your p l going up well those are unrealized gains that's not something that is uh um it's not real yet because it's only on paper right 
Uh, I see a couple questions coming up real quick. Um, when is the best time to protect, uh, purchase a protective put? Uh, when IV is low, yes, or a longer time frame, such as three months out covering an earnings announcement. You are dead on, Chen. That's exactly what I'm looking at is uh, I look at, and we're going to get into that a little bit further. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves. 90 plus days to expiration is what I'm looking at. And that binary event being, you know, at least 30 days out. Um, would be probably my minimum for doing that. Once you get inside of that earnings event, we really start to see that volatility start ratcheting up. And if you can get this uh, when volatility is relatively low and that volatility starts ratcheting up, you guys, you can be directionally wrong and those puts will retain their value. And maybe sometimes, you know, if it really starts jacking up, um, you can really start seeing that uh put despite the fact that you're directionally wrong make money right uh it is possible and it does happen especially um like with gold you can see gold start going north and uh put start increasing in value volatility has a tendency to jack up in gold on on a bullish move all right protecting unrealized gains i've kind of mentioned that you know if you want to protect something that you've had on for a long time, you've had on a nice run, you wanna protect those gains, a uh, good opportunity to put on uh, some protective puts. Stock restrictions. Now, if, this always rem reminds me of the famous Mark Cuban uh, trade, and his was actually a collar. And when he uh, got rid of broad, uh, what is it, broadcast.com or broad, or something like that. I can't even remember anymore. But basically, he got a ton of Yahoo stock. Uh, Yahoo was trading around 240 to 250. Well, he ended up putting on a collar around it because he wasn't able to sell it. They told him, you can't sell this stock for you know this duration. Um, so what did he do? He went out and bought basically puts and he sold some calls. He wanted to lock in that price at that area. Well, that was actually the high that Yahoo had ever seen. Um, and ultimately, those uh, puts that he had on, uh, you know, it, it, it enabled him to uh, get past this whole stock restriction clause. Um, so sometimes if you're at a company, they won't let you sell uh, stock, but, you know, you can buy some puts and things of that nature. And that allows you to get out of selling because you're not really selling them. You're, you're, banks, you're doing some puts against it and um, you end up getting past that time frame where they're, they're putting that restriction on. All right. Um, and it can protect you from the tax implications of capital gains, right? If you have to worry, if you're worrying about capital gains, maybe you've owned this stock for, you know, a century. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, from a very low level and um, and you want to protect some of those uh, capital gains for one and don't want to have to pay, you know, say, for instance, you bought Tesla at, at you know, in the 20s or 30s several years back. And now we're at a thousand. Well, those, that's some serious tax implications that you would have uh, on capital gains there. Well, if you're buying these protective puts, you know, if, you know the bottom fell out right now in Tesla and um, it went back to 200, well, you would actually be able to uh, protect yourself from some of those tax implications from owning it from way back. You know, you're not gonna get dollar for dollar on the down move, but if it broke down to 200, it would, it would very much feel like you uh, were able to capture that whole move because of the deltas increasing and everything. All right, all right, so, Ken, on yours, we want to look to minimize that theta contraction. And how do we do that? Well, normally when we are selling options, we want to get inside of this theta contraction zone, right? Well, we want to avoid that completely. So I like to get out here past that. I should have driven, drawn it a little bit further, but I like to go about 90 days to expiration or uh, actually greater than 90 days to expiration because we'll see this start to flatten out even further, the further out we go. You know, we used to call it theta, the thief in the night that comes and steals your premium on the floor. And this is when the theta goes bonkers, all right? 
that's really when you start seeing that premium get sucked out. So even though you are trying to protect a binary event that is, you know, um, even if it was only 35 days away or something like that, you know, I would still go out there uh, past that 90 days to expiration, capture that binary event for protection, but still be out there, avoid that theta contraction. We also have to be pretty weary about volatility because volatility, if it expands, that is a good thing, all right? That's, you know, we want volatility to expand. That's why I want you to get outside of that binary event 30 days out. That's when you should be thinking, you know, outside of 30 days away from that binary event. This is a pretty good uh, slot where we're kind of past most of the major earnings and we're thinking about the next earnings, you know, maybe they've given some forward guidance that didn't look so good, you know, um, or you're worried about uh, uh, China or uh, these guys being able to build inventory and uh, things of that nature. Uh, Apple having the iPhone 12 get uh, um, uh, production worries, all right, which is going to hit their bottom line. All right. So getting into earnings next season, that is a good time to start imp implementing this because right after that binary event, volatility is probably at or near its lowest levels, all right? So volatility expanding will help us. So we can talk about volatility for some of the newer people because this is a uh, newer type of strategy. So volatility, <clears throat> Volatility is pretty simple beast, and uh, I'll just take a look at the March ones. And remember, volatility, actually, here, I'll, I'm going to change that up. Let's just look at 14 days uh, or, or 14 strikes. All right, so volatility, Vega. The first thing we need to know about volatility is that for every 1% increase in volatility right here, this Vega number, so it goes from 77 to uh, 77 and a half to 78 and a half, right? So it goes up by one percentage point increase. So it goes up by one percentage point. All of these premiums over here are going to increase by this amount over here in this column. So if it goes from 77.58 to 78.58, these premiums are going to increase over here by 30 seven cents, all right? These are gonna increase by 29 cents. That's with everything else being equal. This does not move at all, uh, but the the volatility increases. You know, we're trying to uh, compare apples to apples here. I don't wanna, you know, get Theta the thief in there or any of that stuff, but just keep in mind that for every 1% increase, our premiums will increase by the corresponding Vega, all right? So, you know, you can do the multiples of that, two, three, four, five, ten, you know, 10, 10% uh, increase. Those are going to increase by $2, all right? So, and vice versa, for every decrease of 1%, our premiums are going to decrease by that vega, right? A negative plus a positive equals a negative. Vega is a positive because it's based on an increase, all right? All, all of the deltas, the gammas, and everything else, is basically uh, theoretical on a uh, positive, right? Theta, 14 cents is by a day, all right? So increase by a day, theta is the thief, it is a negative. So a plus a day equals minus the theta, right? You can't go back in time. So theta is always working against you. Um, and you can see here, theta is 14 cents. And when I show you the, uh, the theta component further out, We'll see it's a lot less. Um, but Vega increases by, uh, or the, the Vega column here, increase by 1%, that increases our premium by that corresponding amount. Um, and vice versa, a negative to it is a negative. So you can see here, the theta component, much less uh, of a worry, half as much Vega, so you, or uh, sorry, theta, so you can see that theta uh, will start to increase the closer we get to expiration. Again, what I was talking about, Vega, 
volatility affects the further duration options more. So we want to get further out in time uh, outside of that 90 days. Why? Because we limit theta eating away at that premium we bought and we can take advantage of volatility when it increases. But that also makes it very important that we do not want to get into uh, a situation where we have high implied volatility percent. And when we're talking about high implied volatility percent, there's a couple of things. Well, we look at implied volatility percent. So we can see here, Apple has started ratcheting up a little bit, but it's below my threshold of 50. Anything below an IV percent of 50 is where we're looking at buying premium. Anything above that is where we start looking to sell premium. But um, you can see volatility, you know, we had that big spike here, which was a bit of an anomaly. And I don't know why I have that on a three year chart here, but let's go back to the weekly. So, um, so you can see that volatility here um, is kind of mid range, which, you know, it could expand, it could contract. So uh, I would expect that with some of these worries around uh, the coronavirus, that volatility is going to remain elevated and their next earnings is coming out in and around this area. So we also want to get outside of that so that we can take advantage of it. Even if volatility does start to dwindle a little bit, yes, that could hurt us, but we are going to be in and around that binary event where we see, or at least past that binary event where we see that volatility expand to the highs. And I'm sure uh, we are going to see some highs happening in and around the binary event the next time we have an earnings in Apple. It might even be, you know, breaking above some of this because of um, the worries about them being able to move product right now. So I would be comfortable about buying puts uh, around Apple, which I'm probably going to use as an example. Because everybody has Apple in their supply chain disruption, weaker Chinese demand. Yes, all all through uh, all through that everything. You know, something to note, you guys, uh, uh, I don't even, it, their pollution is way down right now. Um, like thousands of metric tons down because of the coronavirus and the factory slowing down. So everybody is going to have supply chain just disruptions. You know, anything that's coming into the ports getting locked up for uh, longer periods of time. Uh, so there is huge uh, supply chain disruption going on right now. All right, uh, and if they're not working, you guys, if the Chinese are not working right now, they are not buying, right? You know, think about it. when you're not getting paid, you are not buying anything. All right, and how do we find the op optimal strike location? Well, we're gonna be looking at like standard deviations. You can look at a correct, you can put this in where your stop is. I like to go out, to around the 10 delta, all right? So, you know, that 10 delta is gonna land somewhere right in between the, uh, the minus one standard deviation and the minus one and a half standard deviation, okay? Um, some people will look at like the 35 delta, which is a half standard deviation. You know, this is gonna be somewhere close to that. Um, I like to go further out and I'll talk about that a little bit more, um, you know, it's interesting. I sometimes say that I've, I've forgotten more about options than what I, I remember. And when I go through different scenarios of things, uh, all of a sudden the light bulb comes back on and uh, I remember why. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody about, you know, when uh, you're buying options, the person was wanting to buy in the money options. And I was talking about how we wanted to buy out of the money options and why that was more beneficial. And I'll go into that. Uh, here relatively soon. As soon as we'll pull up the, I don't see any, uh, I don't see any questions coming out right um, at this point anyway. So let's pull back up this option montage. <clears throat> All right. So you know we were talking about uh, one of the things. You know, is it the right underlying? We have to make sure that thirty somewhere around that thirty-five days to expiration, we have pretty tight bid ask during open market operations. One of my rules here is if it's over $100 stock, move the decimal three ticks to the left. And that's how wide the bid ask should be down here. So in this, this case, um, you know, I moved the decimal three ticks to the left there and we've got about 32 cents, right? So then we look down here and these all should be 
you know, the, in the, or the ones that are just out of the money, maybe just at the money should be, uh, you know, within 30 cents to the bid ask. Okay. Anything that is, if it's less than a hundred dollars stock, if X, Y, Z is, sorry, less than, if it's less than a hundred dollars stock, then um, it's gotta be equal to or less than 10 cents wide, all right? So we can go over and look at other examples of something that I don't even know what this is. Um, American Airlines, it's less than a hundred dollars stock. You can see the days to expiration and it fits that rule. It's at least less than 10 cents stock. I don't even have to I'll look at something closer to a $50 XOM, Exxon Mobil, um, you know, you can look at lows, three ticks to the left, we're looking at 12 and a half cents, and you can see that that fits this rule as well, all right? Starts getting any wider than that, you know, I mean, an example of somebody that I was talking about buying these into money options, like he was looking at a $50 uh, stock, and the bid offer was during open market operations, 40 cents wide, all right? You know, there's no eyeballs on a, uh, in the options, on something that has 40 cent wide uh, strikes on, you know, a less than a hundred dollar stock, right? There's going to be maybe 20 open interest. Well, that guy's got other, whoever has that 20 open interest, those guys are got better fish to fry right now. And they're looking at, you know, the apples and everything else on a constant basis. They might come over and check the markets every once in a while, but uh, you know, something like with Lowe's, we'll be able to see if we go to the volume and open interest, you can see there is a lot of open interest and a lot of volume on any given day, all right? Um, maybe not so much in the puts, but um, you can see that there's still some pretty good open interest going on and uh, good volume on a day-to-day -day basis. Looks like somebody did the, uh, the strangle. Um, it's probably just a coincidence. Uh, but anyway, you can see that <clears throat> volume and open interest will tighten up these markets. Just think about it, you guys, when free market price discovery is in full swing, if we all had apples to sell, you know, we're gonna be looking at each other like, okay, how much you selling your apple for? You know, and and trying to at least match prices and stuff like that, all right? So uh, that's what happens in the options as well. If somebody comes in at 391 offer, or sorry, 291 offer here on these 130 calls, Somebody else might be, hey, you know what? I want to, I want that guy to come to me and, you know, I'm going to better my bid because right now I'm basically $2.80 bid. So I might up that uh, a little bit to 287 or something, just bettering those markets. And then all of a sudden somebody else says, oh, now the guy that was bidding 286 sees you just jumped him and he bids up to 288 or something like that. So that's what's happening in these markets constantly um so uh something like for apple let's just take a look at this <clears throat> so let's take a look at uh aa sorry that's you know one of those things like you, you you call somebody by the wrong name once and you always think their name's wrong i always think that apple should be a p p l um all right so apple we're going to be looking at some more strikes here. So let's just go to uh, 30 strikes anyway. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and let's look at the deltas. Now, when I was talking about with the, let's take a look at the 35 delta. You know, some people might look at that um, because that's, uh, you know, or let's just say even the 30 delta because that could be close to a 30% or a 10% correction or something like that, whatever you're looking at. I like to look at around that 10 delta, okay? I find that that um, gives me enough wiggle room. I am also liking to be the trader of this. I wanna limit how much I'm paying for it, right? So if you're looking at like the 35 delta, uh, 35 or 40 delta we could look at, um, then, when the market comes down here, for one, yeah, you're going to make money. You're probably going to uh, be able to increase your value of it, right? So, you know, some people um, would say 
that if you're doing a protective puts, that's kind of your location is that one, one standard deviation moved down that 35 delta there. Uh, so I am looking to be more of a trader of this. I want to kind of limit my exposure. I hate buying premium. So um, I'm going to be looking around that 10 delta. So let's look at the theoretical stuff here. Um, so for instance, if we got this, I think it was a 305 puts, right? It was right around that 35 delta. Uh, let's just say we got a, and I like to do um, that 10 delta. Uh, so it was the 260 strike. Okay. So these are the two we're looking at. Why is that uh, reset? Um, oh, it was yesterday's pricing. Um, so, uh, I like to look at that 260 put, all right? So let's just say we got like a, a, a $10, $10, maybe even a $20 move down. Let's just say it's a negative $20 move. So we get a $20 move. Now we can take a look at, there, um, the 305 puts, right? They increased by $8. Now that's better than my, 260 puts, they only increased by, uh, you know, a couple of dollars there. Now, but something to look at here. If my 305 puts increased by $8 there, how much of an increase is that? Um, here's my calculator. Let's look at our calculator. So, and it's going to take a second because I don't know a faster way to do this right offhand now that I'm uh, in the moment. Um, so the 305s are trading right around 1175. So 1175, um, 1175, and that increased by eight dollars. So that's by basically, whoops, 1175. I'm trying to do math in my head at the same time. That's an increase, pretty good actually, a lot better than what I was looking at earlier. Uh, 1.5 is it one and a half? So 17 ish. Why does that theoretical price seem odd? Oh, $20 price adjustment resulting to $20. Hmm. This just seems like it's jacked up really high off of that much of a move. But anyway, so they increased by $8. Mine increased by $2. So um, pull up that calculator again. So 17, got to get to 20. So basically uh, the 1175 times what is that 1.6 then? 18, Jeez. this isn't working out very well. Uh, 1175 times 1. 1.8, $21. So that's pretty, so 1.75 is uh, what we're increasing by there. Let's call it that. So uh, how much did my uh, 260 puts increase by? So we're right around that 280. So let's say 2.8 times that one point uh seven five ish so that's at four dollars and ninety cents so they increased by more than that so uh i'm looking at the 260s so two two dollars and eighty cents times the 1.9 that gets me a little bit closer so you can see that you know what i'm doing here by saying 1.9 it's increasing by 90 percent right so these puts are increasing in percentage terms more, right? So although these uh, puts right here increased by 175, right? We were talking about that 1175, took me a minute, uh, times 1.75, right? Because that's it means it increases by 75% really is how, we're, how we do that. So $20 and... Uh, 50 cents. So it increased by about 75%. Whereas the puts down here, my, 
where I'm doing it at 280, $2.80, just kind of going mid market times 1.9, right? That gives me pretty close. It's actually a little bit more than that, right? It's um, more than a 90% increase here. So in percentage terms, these are increasing more. So I get more bang for my buck for every one lot. Now, that's why I would like to pick these down a little bit further because remember, I want to limit my risk on buying these and them being worthless. Whereas, you know, that's a pretty hefty uh, put to buy when you're fighting theta decay and everything else, right? So I would rather limit how much I'm, I'm going to buy it for. And then I would probably do it by four contracts, especially if I was worried about Apple having a correction, you know, some profit taking going on, supply chain disruption, the iPhone 12 not even being made or something like that. I would probably put on like four of these. So in that, you know, if we're looking at the $2.80 I'd pay, or maybe even $2.85 times uh, four contracts that I would do, you know, I'm over hedging my 100 lot if I only owned 100 of these. I usually do about four of those or three to four times how many I have on. Remember, I, I paid up here for these 305 puts uh, $11.80, let's say, if it's mid-market, eleven, let's say $11.90. If I bought four of them, you know, I'm getting uh, these four for a little bit cheaper still, you know? So if you are used to buying the 35 Delta or somebody has told you to do that and thought that was a good idea, this is a pretty good argument to go down there to the 260s and buy four of them. And then you peel them off, you know? Maybe I get a move down to 300 and you find, hey, you know what? It's it's finding support at around that 300 level. Well, these have, these 260s have increased dramatically. Uh, we already showed how much they're going to increase on a $20 move, and uh, that that's right there. So we're going to see that these 260 puts have increased by uh, up to $5. Well, if I peeled off three of them or even two of them, I even just one of them, uh, not two of them, I paid for the entire thing, right? Because I originally paid $11.40. Well, if I I get that $20 move down and if I support it at the 300 level, I take off two of them. Now I've got these puts on for free. So that's what I'm talking about. Like I'd like to trade around these and, and try and add a few more protective puts uh, to, to trade that if it starts to happen. Yeah, I'm further away. Um, and I didn't just buy a one lot to protect that 100 underlying I have. I went down to the 260s, bought a couple extra ones. Right. And then if the market makes a move, my puts never got hit. I can peel off one or two of these. Right. And have those puts on for free now. All right. So that's the way I would like to trade the protective puts. Yeah, it's not the perfect, you know, quote unquote, perfect uh, one to one ratio that, you know, you're going to go online and say they, they talk about a protective put. They're going to tell you to do a one lot. Right. This is a little bit different. I know you guys are traders. Not everybody doing this, getting into options, um, is just looking to protect the total amount that they have on. I like to, if I'm, I'm thinking I have 100 Apple on, or, you know, if I had on 500 Apple, I'd probably do a 10 lot, you know, um, or something like that. I would increase it by an, a multiple of that. Um, and if the market makes that move down, doesn't even have to hit my puts. I would just be looking to try and cover that. So I have those puts on for free. And if the market continues to tank, then, um, then I'm getting uh, paid for that. You know, if my stop was at 260 or something like that, then I, I, I'm not making any money on that down move. Whereas with the puts, at least you are. Yes, you do have that risk of uh, it going straight up. And, and never correcting, but at least with this peace of mind, you know, around everything that uh, Apple could be experiencing, then you'll be able to take advantage of that, all right? So it's more of a trader mentality on these protective puts that I like to uh, implement this in and around. But make sure, you know, to keep in mind, our implied volatility percent is below 50. And, and how do we come up with implied volatility percent? Well, 
we take where the current is 27 and uh, subtract that by the low, which is uh, 18, maybe 18, 19. So we need to know these three numbers, the current, the low, and the high, which is 36, all right? Uh, we'll call it 37 to try and make math easy. Uh, as a matter of fact, let's make math real easy and say the high is 37, the low is 17, and the current is 27, right? So basically, you have uh, take the current IV minus the low IV, especially if your platform doesn't have that, and divide that sum by the high IV minus the low IV, all right? So we said the current's 27, the low is 17, and the high was uh, 37. We wanna make sure that we take the sum of uh, minus 17, right? And then we get 10 divided by 20, which equals one half or 50%, right? Okay, very close to where this was, 56 point. You know, if you come up with the exact number, but we know it's uh, in and around that level. It's kind of the, the, uh, the split, you know, where you're buying or selling premium right now. You would definitely want to expect the implied volatility to go higher, uh, so that it helps out with those premiums, okay? So that's how you come up with implied volatility percent. I have the uh, the script that goes into there to uh, pull this up. That's, you can see I have it listed from high to low because implied volatility is for each underlying self. You know, that's what implied volatility percent tells us because, you know, something like Apple at 27 and a high of, uh, 38 right there, we can look at Tesla and see that Tesla never gets that low. Like, I guess it does, called me a liar. 35 is the ultimate low in the last 52 weeks for Tesla. So you can see everybody has its own implied volatility, right? And not each stock is created equally when it comes to implied volatility. So we have to know where this current 86 is what does that mean? It means really absolutely nothing unless you put it into perspective. And that's what we try to do with that implied volatility percent, okay? It puts it in perspective, where it is now in relation to where it's been in the past, all right? So uh, make sure you're paying attention to that. When it's at extreme lows, um, that is the time to be buying it, right? You know, another example of um, Activision. You know, it's high as 50 and it has a pretty good range, but 27 doesn't really tell us anything. We saw Apple's 27 is an IV percent of 50, whereas for Activision, that's almost near its lows. So you need to know what that is in order to implement this. So anything below 50, uh, we look to buy premium because we expect that to expand. You can see anytime it's ever gotten down there, it's had a tendency to start ramping up. Uh, well, anytime it's, at those extreme highs, you know, at 90% or whatever, you start seeing volatility come out. It's not sustainable. So we don't wanna be buying premium right before that binary event. Remember I said right after the earnings event is probably one of the better times to be buying. Yeah, it did dip on us, but you can see volatility did expand, all right? And then when it got crushed afterwards, yeah, you're gonna see Maybe your directional move against you. We got volatility expanding, but once it got crushed afterwards, you know, it it really kind of put that volatility back to where we were buying it. <clears throat> All right. Pretty simple though, right? You know, if if you just want to do a one lot at that 10 delta, I totally get it. Um, limit what your cost is putting out there. To me, if I start having a worry about something on my underlying, maybe supply chain disruption, like we talked about with Apple or a slowing economy or something like that, I like to trade around that. You know, if I don't want to get rid of that underlying, you know, if, I, if I'm all of a sudden bearish on this thing and think that they're going to tank, then why not just get out of it right now? But 
if I want to hold on to that stock, maybe I like the dividend, uh, something along those lines, protect some capital gains, not have to take tax implications, then I like to trade around it, add a couple extra puts to that uh, assumption of a correction happening, but not really uh, get rid of my stock necessarily. Let's stay away from that 35 delta that a lot of people talk about where you should be doing it or that 10% correction. All right, so options course, earnings with options. I talked specifically about trades for, op uh, for earnings using options, you guys. When and where, timing, all of that stuff. When you should be selling calls or selling puts uh, around the options. And not only that, you guys, it's about earnings setup. So like right now, we are. you might be thinking, oh, earnings is already passed, but all the good earnings are already out. Well, this is the time to be setting up strategies for the next earnings, okay? So these are trades not only specifically for that earnings event, that binary event, or anything uh, that is causing you know, where maybe there's a, 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 a drug trial coming out for your bio stocks, right? Or the FOMC meeting coming up. Anytime those things are binary events that we can be taking advantage of. So uh, earnings with options, this is a great course for 36 bucks. You know, I even go into this and talk about guys that are on mainstream media all the time talking about earnings trades and what you should be doing, like buying calls or something crazy like that. Um, and why that is not beneficial. And for $36, I will save you the angst of losing money on those types of trades that those guys were touting on TV. So great deal for uh, earnings with options. You can, guys can watch these over and over and over again. We'll also do the earnings setup. So once we get out of earnings and earnings are down the road, how we can put on a trade for that next earnings event um, and limit data decay or uh, isolate some of that volatility, take advantage of vol volatility expansion going into the next earnings event. So, uh, and I go into specific rules, uh, the type of underlying, the volatility you need and all of those things. So uh, this is in the chat window. If you're watching this on tape delay, you are gonna have to punch this into your URL, which is at the top there uh, and just pause the, webinar right now, but highly suggest taking advantage of this. You know, my bread and butter is in and around earnings. It's uh, it's great because you've got high premium. If you like selling options, uh, take advantage of this. All uh, right, so that's about it. I wanna thank you guys all for uh, watching this webinar. Later webinars, they'll drill down on different op option components, when and where I find those appropriate. Here's also the link. Uh, Pro Trader Strategies, Option Courses, uh, slash Earnings with Options. Have any questions, reach out to us, 310-598-6677 or trading at protraderstrategies.com. Or if you guys have any suggestions of webinars you want us to, uh, to cover or videos you want me to cover, reach out to us. We, can, we probably have them in the archive. Uh, there again is the number and our website URL if you're watching this on tape delay. All right, that's all I got for you guys. Thanks for joining me. And if you can't take that, take it easy. Thank you, Chen, appreciate it. Thank you, Nina, for the kind words. Appreciate it, everybody. Take care, Alexander.